Well, it's a blessing to be here this morning. We thank the Lord for everyone that came out this morning. And uh, as we begin, I'd like to ask Homer if you'd open us, please, brother. Amen. If you would, please open your Bibles to John chapter 17 this morning. John chapter 17 as we continue our study uh, of the chapter of John. And as we begin here this morning, I thought I might just say this. It's interesting when we think about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we think about the perception that the world kind of has of him. Oftentimes, people see him in his humility, they see him walking, they see him in his long robes, they see the kindness of him, they understand that part of him, but they don't truly see Christ. They don't truly see Christ. And you know, in our study here this morning, what we're kind of looking at in this study is, is we're looking at the Lord's Prayer for his disciples, which is where we'll be kind of picking up this morning. Our scripture is going to be uh, the first uh, 10 chapters of, of John chapter 17. But we're going to see that the Lord, he, one of his, part of his prayer is that the world would now come to understand, which his disciples are just beginning to see a little glimpses of, of who he truly is. He's God. And they need to understand that he is God and who he is. And we're going to look at some of the examples that we see in the scriptures this morning by God's grace. So with that, let's begin our reading of chapter 17, 1 through 10. And it says, and this is, of course, as we're beginning our study. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee, before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto men, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in thee. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Father, that we are blessed as we are here this morning to have a place to literally come and join together, Father, in fellowship one with another, to have your word in our hand and in our homes, and, Father, to be able to open it and read it. But, Father, we know just to read it means nothing. We need to have an open heart through the indwelling of the Spirit to be open to your wonderful truth and be guided by it in truth. So we ask you this morning to help us in these areas to see the things that you'd have us to see this morning, that we may grow in your grace and in your truth. Much of what we'll be talking about this morning, most of us are familiar with, Lord, and know in our hearts and minds. I believe everyone here knows you and has received you as their Savior. But, Lord, at the same time, there's a world out there that is lost and dying, and these are really challenging times. So help us to be better prepared, to be open to your leading and guiding in all that we think, say, and do. And that, Lord, you would be glorified in all things. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Primarily, we're going to be looking at the latter part of this uh, study this morning. We're going to be looking at base, verses 5 through 10. But uh, we want to remember that uh, as we looked at what Schofield said, we're going to be looking at the restoration of the eternal glory 
that, that what Jesus is kind of talking about here. Jesus did the great things. He committed them to the Father in prayer. You know, millions of people today claim, claim, to, uh, claim to know Christ, and we just mentioned that a little bit as we started. And I think it's important to think about this. But you know, the problem is they're victims of a false religion. They're trusting in things without really knowing what they're truly trusting in. They really haven't come to know, to truly know God. But they will still, at the same time, basically deny the true deity of Christ. Oh, he was a great man. He was a great prophet. He was even the son of God, but he wasn't, he was a son or these, he wasn't the son of God. He wasn't God himself. And we, we need to be aware of that, that there's many people walking around who think that they know Christ, but they really have never received Christ. And this is a, there's so much going on in the world today. We need to be aware that we are to be good stewards of what he's given us. They claim to know God, but the deity of Christ, this is a fatal era. What we have here is, however, not so much a definition of eternal life as a statement of the reason why Christ imparts eternal truth. And that is so that we may know the Father. Remember we talked about last week how important it is that we see in the Scriptures as we look at the Old Testament and we see how few times the word Father is used. They didn't have that kind of personal relationship that Jesus wants us to have with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. A very personal and individual relationship that we're to have with Him. What a wonderful place we live in in this day and time is how we've been blessed. So that we may know the Father, the only true God, as Christ knows him. That's how he wants us to know them. The Lord's goal was not only to include the manifestation of the person and the power of his Father, but also to manifest the purpose of the Father. The purpose of the Father. We look at verse 4 again in John 17. Notice what he says. Jesus says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Thus the Lord sums up his divine purpose of his coming to earth. From the incarnation to the ascension, the Lord glorified his Father. And now we come to verse 5. And here we read, And now, O Father, Glorify me with thy own self, with, with the glory which I had with thee, what? Before the world was. Before the world was. You know, we might paraphrase this by saying, it's what he was saying basically, so far they have only seen me as the incarnate son. They've only seen me as the incarnate son in a sense. But now, let the world see me as the infinite one. And remember what his verse just said, when he said there, he said, when he says, O Father, glorify thy, thy own self with the glory which I had with thee, what? Before the world, okay, before the world even was. There is a glory beyond the brightness of the noonday sun, isn't there, my friends? A glory more splendid than the rainbows in the sky. A glory that's literally not of this world. In Isaiah chapter 6, he describes this. I want you to think about what we're talking about. He's going to be talking about the shining ones. This is a wonderful area of Scripture. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. I'm going to read a few verses here. It says, In the year that King Uzzah died, and I saw upon the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train, was, it was, and his train filled, filled the temple. I want to back up just a minute. You all know who King Isaiah was? He was considered a good king of, of, uh, of Israel, wasn't he? He was, one of the good, he was one of the good kings. But you know he kind of messed up, didn't he? He got full of himself, went into the temple, started making sacrifices, and the Lord slapped him down. He had actually defeated the, the, uh, pal, uh, the uh, Philistines at that point. He had been a good king in a lot of ways, but he did that, and the Lord punished him by what? Leprosy, right? And he died a pretty bad death. It was a pretty notable thing that he says here when he talks about Isaiah, when he's talking about Uzziah, and he's talking about this particular crime. People would have known by the time that he was talking about. So he's telling what he sees here in this vision at that particular time. And it's, a, it's an amazing vision when you kind of look upon it. And I wanted to um, 
Oh, well, anyway, we'll just pick it up from there. He says, in the year the king Uzziah died, and I saw upon, and I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You know what a train is? You ever been to a nice wedding? Those ladies, they have those long trains. What do those symbolize? In a sense, huh? Money. That's good. It's money. That's right. Dad. Kind of putting out all for one time. They put it in the closet, they're going to save it. And of course, their daughters come along. Guess what? They don't want it. They want their own, you know. So, but anyway, all that aside. But the point is, is that they have to be served, don't they? They have to be served. They do nothing of their own. It's, it's, it's portraying that kind of thing. So that one that filled the whole thing says he is everything, isn't it? He is to be served is the idea. But going on beyond that, so this is where we want to get into it. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain they covered their face. With twain they covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and, say, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now we think of the words uh, of, of a... Uh, what does the word uh, seraphim mean? What, what does it actually mean? Well, it means burning ones, and that's the idea here. We looked in, uh, 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 I think it says Uriah, we can look at it in 113. But there, what, what it, the idea is, is that there appears one like a burning coal of fire, like the appearing of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. And the fire was bright. Out of the fire went, went lightnings, that certain seem to describe the burning ones. I want you to think about that just a minute. This description that he has of this when he's talking about a seraphim. Can you imagine a being being like what he's talking about? The six wings, the majesty of this, of this, of this, uh, of this, uh, of this seraphim. With the six wings and the power that it had, the fire that literally came out of it, the absolute oddness of this. But notice what we can learn here. When we look at that, he talks about each one had six wings. If we look at that in Revelation, the Apostle John also mentions the six wings. They needed six wings. And you think, well, what do you need six wings for to fly? Don't you just need two? One on each side to kind of get going? But uh, he goes on, this one, one, uh, uh, this one commentator and points this out. He says, he says, first of all, the six wings, each one, the first one was to cover his face to show that they are lowly to look upon the Lord. They were in awe to look upon the Lord. The second was to cover his feet. And this was to hide this, in this humble area of the body so that even, even any kind of possibility of, of, of defiance or, or, or anything that was dirty or anything like that would not be seen in the sight of the Lord. And of course, the last was to fly. But we can see the kind of humility that we see in the Old Testament concerning looking upon this Holy One. We can also think of Saul of Tarsus. Well, we all know the story of Saul. won't go too much into that. We all know how he started. What a great man of God he was in the religious world, wasn't he? He was a Pharisee. He was on his way. He was an up-and-comer in my humble opinion. He was a brilliant man going really high. He goes in and pray. He goes in and asks the Asked the council, give him permission to go to Damascus and pull out men and women, anyone he could find, bind them up and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial, for being a Christian, right? And we kind of know what happens on the Damascus road. And beginning in verse 9 of Acts, we read, And saw, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughterings against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he that if he found any in, uh, of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Now please notice in verse 3. And as he, searched, uh, and, and as he uh, journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined, there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saw, saw. Why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, 
whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished. He, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Of course, we know that he was blind at that point, had to be led to the city. This humbling experience we see that brought him all the way to the ground as he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And then again, we can think of John, the apostle, prostate, as we see in Revelation 1.9, when it says, I, John, who am also, am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. What's he saying in that verse? He's in Patmos. Why? It's a great island, wonderful place beautiful beaches, just a great place to be, right? Is that what he's saying? No. It's like being in prison, isn't it? He was taken there to take him out of society, to abandon him, to lead a life like a hermit. He was left to himself. That's what he's talking about. He says, but I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a, tri of a, as of a trumpet saying, this is, listen, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What does that say? I am eternal. There's no beginning and no ending for me. I am eternal. I am from everlasting to, ever, to, to, ever, to everything in the future. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Stardust, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake unto me, and I being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of those seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, feet, foot, and guarded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flaming fire, and his feet like unto fire, uh, like unto fine brass, and as it as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as uh, the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. And when I saw him. I fell down at his feet as dead. John? Did not John walk with the Lord for three and a half years? Had not John been part of that at his resurrection and uh, seeing him after that in, in different ways through, the, through that 40-day period, some of the ministries that went on? But now what does he see? He sees the Lord Jesus Christ glorified. He sees the Lord, Jesus Christ, God, and he is flat on his face as a dead man. Yes, we see this. Now let me figure out where I was at. Okay, and then in verse 19 it says, Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now I thought this was interesting. Through the indwelling of the Spirit, as we, we're going to be studying as we go further into our study, we talked a little bit about the Holy Spirit and how Jesus was talking to his disciples about the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, what all was going to take place. But we see here that the actual revelation of what is going to come about is given by whom? By Jesus Christ again, isn't it? It's part of his ministry. He is the one that wrote the book. He is the one that is the book of, of the revelation. So I thought that was interesting. Just kind of, you know, I've read over that many times, but when I looked at this, I thought, that's interesting. It is Christ himself that's revealing the things that we look at now concerning the book of the Revelation. He's going to give them such light here. Yes. And then in verse 20, he says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand are the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are 
the seven churches. So I want to bring a little bit more of that in and just stop where I had originally, I could have stopped up there at uh, verse 11. He talks about being the Alpha and the Omega and kind of the, that part of it. But I wanted to bring in the last part because it's important to understand the eternal purpose of God as we're seeing God the Father and God the Son and how all of this has been part of their program and the church also is part of that program. And it's important to understand that all of this is of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all working together. And they all have a plan and purpose which was foreknown before the world ever was. And our Jesus, the one that we love, the one that we have come to know as our Lord and Savior, he came to this earth to offer himself as the only sacrifice that could be made that could bring us once again that wonderful fellowship that he had had with the Father. And it's what he says in his word. He wants us to have that kind of fellowship that he has with the Father. He wants us to know the Father as he knows the Father, a God of love. But let us not, no, but let us not water that down. Let us understand that he is a God of righteousness, isn't he? He is a righteous God, and it, within him is no unrighteousness at all. And we need to be concerned about that. And those that take lightly the, the name of Jesus and just don't go anywhere with it and don't really consider what it, what it really is, who Jesus really is, are in danger oftentimes of maybe not truly knowing the Lord. Now, I'm not saying you can't be saved and not, you have to really have this deep knowledge of the Lord. But if you have truly come to know Jesus Christ, I don't believe you can turn and go the other way. I don't believe you can turn and literally deny the Lord. I mean, you can go out into the world, you can do a lot of things, but the one thing you really can't do is you can't deny Jesus Christ is Lord. If you're saved, that's something that you cannot utter. It won't come out of your mouth. You may do all kinds of horrible things. And he'll forgive you for that. But that is one of the things that we need to be cautious of. And there's many people today that are trusting in their works, trusting in their church, trusting in their, in their priests or their pastors or, or whatever it is that they think their family is to be saved. And they are not looking to the only true thing, which is the Word of God. And remember, Jesus is the Word. And this Word is true, and it is the only truth that there truly is in the world for all things. Sometimes we forget that too, don't we? This book is eternal and all that it says is forever. This was the glory that Jesus put aside before he came into the earth. The sight, you can just imagine, we've just, some things we just described. Can you see the dazzling of this? The brightness of this? Just thinking about the Lord and this is just a little glimpse of him. Now, this is a brightness I would say beyond brightness, purity beyond purity, righteousness beyond righteousness. The world, and I mean all the world, will see his glory when it comes. And we want to think just a minute. Remember what we learned about in Philippians 2.9 when it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And what's it going to say? It says, that at the name of Jesus, remember that name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. There's a day coming every knee is going to bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day is going to come. There's going to come a day that they are going to know that Jesus, no matter who you are, will bow to him and acknowledge that he is he is God. Now in verses 6 through 8, we go on to say Jesus speaks of his, of his mission among his disciples here and their reception of it. Notice in verses 6 through, through 8 we read, he says, this is Jesus speaking. Remember, he's, he's praying and he says, I have manifest thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were and thou gavest gave us them me, and they have kept thy word. Now, they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which I, I mean, the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them, 
and have known surely that I came from thee, and have believed that thou didst send me. We look at this, and it talks about how having manifest thy name. The word name here includes the attributes of the character of God. Jesus had made known his character, his law, his will, his plan, his mercy, or in other words, he had revealed God unto them, hadn't he? In his very being. The word name often refers or to, a, uh, to, 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 to distinguish a certain person or a person. And that's the case here. For the 11 disciples, Jesus had given the most precious gift in all the universe, hadn't he? He had given them the biggest gift that could ever be given. The revelation of himself and of the Father and the mission that they were going to be continuing in. The knowledge of which he was. The channel through which his Father's life-giving words could flow to mankind. Remember that Jesus, Jesus throughout his ministry did not say, well, I'm going to do this. What did he say? I do all things through my Father. I do all things through my Father. He constantly was at the work and the will of his Father to accomplish what his Father revealed to him to do. He in virtually said, every word, every deed, everything you see of me cometh from the Father. But well, we know that he and the Father are one, don't we? But we see this, this, this. And we also should see in that, that by God's grace, we should live the same way. Remember, he was 100% man. And he gave us in that humanity uh, the, the type of person we should seek to be. We can never be Christ. Boy, if I try to hold myself to that, I'll never make it, will I? But by God's grace, I can seek his will. And I can seek to follow the path that God has for me as best I can. And recognizing as I learn in John, in John chapter in John and first John, that I'm a sinner. That I'm a sinner. But if I'll confess my sins, he's just and faithful to forgive me of my sins, isn't he? And we need to, well, of course, we, when we ask for forgiveness, what are we asking for? Well, we're asking to be forgiven, of course. But we also should be sincere about it and seeking to take the right path now, shouldn't we? We should be seeking to walk the way the Lord would have us to walk and continue in the work that he has for us just as he had for the Lord. Each one of us have a work. The knowledge of who he is, of who he is uh, of, of who he was and who he is and forever is. He is the one who was eternally co-equal and co-existent with the Father through eternity past and through the eternity future. That's our Lord Jesus Christ, who had come out from the Father to assume a human for, form and a sojourn in this earth. Now, I won't, we won't say much about it, but we've talked about that. What a blessing it is for you and I to consider Jesus Christ, to know that he took on very humanity. He knew what it was to hunger and thirst. He knew what it was to suffer. He knew what it was to take right for wrong or wrong for right. He knew what it was to be humiliated. He knew what it was to be hated for good. He knew what it was to be persecuted for doing right. He knew what it was to be all alone. You ever feel like that? In your walk with the Lord? Nobody seems to understand? Now, I'm not saying be so full of yourself that you are walking in your own truth. But if you're walking with the Lord, be ready to take a stand. Be ready to be where the Lord may lead you and show you where we may have an opportunity to truly stand as Christ did. For us, at the cross, didn't he? Yeah, all had abandoned him. We need to believe and understand that we can have that. Jesus did not simply teach about the name, character of God. It was about his character. And he also manifest and displayed the character of God, didn't he? So when we saw Jesus, we, not, we saw both his character and, 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 and as well as the manifestation of his character. He went on to say, as we see, he says, they have believed that thou didst send me. That was important, wasn't it? 
What's he saying there? They believed. They believed in who he was, didn't they? They received him. One might say in these few verses, Jesus looked at salvation from two points of view. Each perspective being true, if, we, if you look at it. In John 17, 6, for example, he explains that salvation in the election of God, that men, when, it, when, when he said, the men you have given me out of this world, is seen really from God's point of view or God's perspective. But then in John 17, 8, he explains that their salvation is, is, is theirs of faith, that they have believed that you have seen me, that, that, that they've seen him, and seeing it from a, from a human point of view. So we see that faith, from our point of view, is by faith. From God's point of view, he knows all from end to beginning and how it's been chosen before the world even was. God knows everyone. He knows every heart. He knows everything. In verses 9 and 10 now, he says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou gavest me, which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I have glorified, and I am glorified in them. I pray for them. He said, I do not pray for the world. I pray for them. Jesus specifically had his disciples in mind in this prayer. He did not pray in a general sense for the world. Instead, Jesus prayed for these disciples who would carry his message of love and redemption to all the world. Yes, these 11 apostles were to be the foundation of the church, weren't they? It was going to be upon them. He would be the chief cornerstone, and they would be the foundation. He says, I pray for them. When Jesus said that, it was not because he did not care for the lost or the fallen of the world. It was to focus on his own disciples. He was praying for the instrument that he was creating through which he would reach the world. These were the men who were to take the news of the world now, in, now it was important that he pray that the focus be upon them. He did not pray for the world. It is not because he did not, he did not have any concern for the world. He, cared for his, he cares for each and every person with compassion, doesn't he? And was ever at, the, at that very moment taking his steps toward the cross. Thinking about this for just a minute, remember he's still on the road to Damascus. We talked about last week whether he's stopping and talking maybe to his, to his 11 or whether he's just walking in prayer. I think he would have stopped because he's actually praying. As he's on his way to the cross, where is his heart? It's not about him. He's praying for us. He's preparing us. He's preparing them. We, I don't think, can, can, can fathom such love for knowing that he already knew they were even going to abandon him after all of this. All the world, what he had been through, all that they had, were doing to him, he knew before he ever even came into this world. And we see the love to complete the mission that God had set for him to, to accomplish. They had determined from eternity past that had to happen for you and I to once again, as he's, we're telling them what he's having here, to regain that fellowship that we once had prior to the fall of Adam, in essence, to now have that access that Adam had of going directly to the Father in prayer, in that throne room always being open unto us. Oh, how blessed we truly are. Yes, he cares for everyone. He cares. He is indeed the Savior of the world. In John 12, 47, uh, well, we can read, uh, we can see it in many verses, there's a number, but I'm just going to read John uh, 4, uh, John chapter 4 and 39 through uh, 42, and it says, and uh, <clears throat> as, as many of the Samaritans of that city, and I'm sorry, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, 
He told me all things that I ever did. Y'all remember this. This is the woman at the well, the woman that had five husbands, and now the one that she was with was not her husband, etc. We know that. But she, this is where this is coming in. She went back and told uh, uh, what happened with her at the well with Jesus. And then it says, So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. Did I leave out a part? Oh, he testified. Okay. So when the Samaritans were, were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own words. And please notice verse 42 now. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy sayings, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. You see, the salvation of the world depends on the witness of those whom the Father has given him out of the world. And it is they who need his intercession at this junction speaking of the disciples. They needed him at this time. There were many that had come, but their faith, you can only imagine how that was crumbling. So many of them were, what were they looking for? They had in their mind, they had left off part of the Scriptures. They only took part of the Scriptures of concerning the Messiah when he would come. They forgot that he was going to be a suffering Messiah too. And there was a price that was going to have to be paid for their salvation. They had forgotten these things. They thought that he was just going to come in and now he was going to defeat Rome and he was going to set up this beautiful kingdom and they were going to have these wonderful high seats in this. In this. And now he had been telling them for some time, get prepared, I'm getting ready to go be with, be with my father. He was telling them these things, but they couldn't hear that, could they? They didn't understand that message and they were still learning. There was so much happening all right now. He says, I pray not for the world. The term world here, as elsewhere, refers to the really the wicked, the rebellious, vicious men. The meaning of this expression here seems to be that Jesus is praying for his disciples as a reason why God should bless them. He says that they were not of this world. If you're here as a child of God this morning, where is your citizenship? Where is your real citizenship? What do we learn in Ephesians? Ephesians tells us that this world is not our home. It tells us the very moment that we came to Christ, God sees us as seated where? In the heavenly. It's a finished work, guys. It's done. Isn't that a blessing to your heart? Not easy to live it out. But you know something? By God's grace, and the dwelling of the Spirit, we have power to live a wonderful life in relation to our true citizenship, not so much to this world. And we get that confused easily. I do. I look for the blessings in the world. Well, Lord, you know, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, and it's all right to ask for things. But that's not what it's about, is it? It should be about glorifying the Lord. For the eternal home that we are a true part of, and what we can present to the Lord that we have done as he has directed us in whatever path that he has for us in our lives, as we would seek to follow that path. Yes, this is the way it was to be. That they had been taken out of the world, that they belong unto God. The petition was not offered for wicked, perverse, for the perverse, rebellious man, but for those that were friends of God who were disposed to receive his favor. This passage then settles nothing about the question whether Christ prayed for sinners. His prayer was for them that uh, for, for them that who uh, his prayer was for them was was them was for them then prayed for his disciples. Well, basically, it's just he prayed for his disciples who were not those who hated him and disregarded his favor. Afterwards. He afterwards extended that prayer for all who should become Christians. We see that in John 17, 20. We're not there yet. It says, Neither pray I for these alone, but them also which shall believe on me through their word. Who's that? Who's that that he's talking about? He's praying for? Is it not you and I? 
Is it not for those that have come to know Him and receive Him as their Lord and Savior? He's talking about here. He's praying for them as well. In other words, He's going to give us the wisdom and guidance that comes from the divine knowledge that comes from our, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives to help us to walk and to be there for us and to give us the wisdom that we need to follow the path that He has for us. For they are thine. This is not an admonishment to the, to the reason why God should pr- protect and guide them. His honor was, concer- was, uh, was concerned in the keeping them. And we may always fill our mouths with such, with such arguments when we come before God and plead that his honor will be advanced by keeping us from the evil and granting us all needful grace. He said, I am glorified in them. I am honored by their preaching and lives. The sense of this passage is, those who are my disciples are thine. They which promote my honor will also promote thine. And I pray, therefore, that they may have need needful grace to honor my gospel and to proclaim it among men. It's good for us to always remember, just thinking about just a bit, the point is, is that Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus said, you cannot say you don't believe in me and you believe in the Father, or that you believe in me and you don't believe in the Father. If you believe in me, you're going to believe in the Father. If you believe in the Father, you truly know the Father, and you believe in Him, you know of me and you would believe in me. It's always together. John 17, 11, And now I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I have come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. You know, Jesus is our great high priest, isn't he? In Hebrews, you know, when we talk about, we're talking about not needing to go to the pastor, you don't need to go to the, to the priest, you don't need to go to any particular one, do we? doesn't mean that we can't seek counsel. It doesn't mean that we can't ask others to pray for us. It doesn't mean that we can't come to others in various ways. But the point is, the one we need to understand, we truly come to, is our great high priest. And that's Jesus Christ. And today, he's sitting there on the right hand of God. We see this. In Hebrews 4.14, it says, Seeing then that we have this great high priest that is passed unto heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let us not be discouraged in these times. For we, have a, for, we have a, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. What a blessing. Any time, day or night, the throne room of our Lord is open unto us. We can go at any time that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. You know, our time of need is pretty constant, really, if you think about it, all the time. Well, listen, we're going to close out there, but I wanted to, we do have a few minutes left, so does anybody have any comments or questions or anything uh, before we actually close here this morning? I'm trying to get a little more time, trying, I'm not doing very well, but I'm trying to get a little bit at the end. Anyone? Amen.